Okay, we are back. We're going to reopen our regularly scheduled December 18, 2023 Board of Education meeting. Welcome and Merry Christmas to everybody who has joined us since our last meeting. Thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, before we get going, just a quick reminder about the cell phones. And I want to say thank you to Adams Elementary and Seabird Elementary on behalf of the Board of Education for these wonderful Christmas cards. And I put them up here every year, and uh, this year will be no different, as long as I keep it up there without falling down. Okay, um, Mr. Hatfield, let's start with roll call. Yes. Uh, President McFarland. Here. Vice President Rausch. Here. Secretary Hatfield is here. Treasurer Lauterbach. Here. Member Blazy. Here. Member Ringgold. Here. Member Horwitz. Here. Still getting a little feedback. Everybody got the mic up? Brad, I think you just turned yourself. Okay. All right, we'll move into our consent agenda. We have item 2.1 is approval of the minutes from the November 20 Board of Education meeting and the November 20 um, special meeting, as well as the November 20 closed session meeting and a December 5th, 2023 special meeting. Uh, item 2.2 is a list of staff that are being recommended for hire. Item 2.3 is a list of staff who have announced their resignations as well as the effective dates. Uh, item 2.4 is a series two bond audit. Item 2.5 is payment of these school systems bills in the amount of $7,572,371. And item 2.6 is a list of legal fees uh, that are all recommended for payment. At this time, I will uh, accept the motion. Motion by Mr. Lauterbach, support by Ms. Horowitz. Any additional discussion regarding the consent agenda items? Scott, yes. uh, special meeting, November 20th minutes. Um, something happened to this document where it's like, it's a stuff is missing and it's a blank page and then it goes on to the next page. So I don't know what happened to it, but we need to fix that. You don't see the issue with the information, it's just the format. I, I don't think I have any problem, but stuff's cut off so it just yeah. needs to be fixed okay so we can think fixed. i have a problem with it but it's not all there so okay um could sorry brad just yep it looks like your printed copy might be a little different because the one on in our packet now has 12 pages to it. this is the november no, the special meeting. this is the special yep. meeting yeah. from november 20th Commitment. Yeah. yeah. Which is what happened. It's so just yeah, yeah. I think it's accurate. It's just okay. All of the agenda items are yeah, anymore. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. And then um, I don't know if we have to bring it out or if you want it in discussion. I would just put my two cents in that. Um, the Allen group, we could either pull it out or I would just say that um, I don't think it's good practice to have a, a blank sheet of for approval in our minutes. Not saying that work wasn't performed, but okay. whether you want to bring it out or leave it as is, that's up to you guys. I think we'll leave it as is uh, for now. There's a reason that it's blank. Are you, you're not seeing this, Brad? Oh, yes, you are seeing the same ones. Yes. Any additional discussion? Just acknowledge the work of Laura and Brian on another bond audit passed. So yeah. Good work. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. Noted. Thank you. Motion carries. All right. We have item 3.1 uh, Shining Stars. Penny. Go into the podium. Also, I just have to say, it feels awkward. I'm presenting them to you, but I stand sort of off to the side. This makes it feel more like we're honoring these folks. So make your way up here, Shining Stars. You know who you are. These uh, four individuals are just brilliant stars on their own. And when you put them together, they are this amazing, brilliant constellation that is our literacy team. And I am super thrilled 
to first present Kim Welter. Come stand by me. Kim is uh, one of our literacy specialists. She joined the MPS team in 2002 as a third grade teacher at Adams. And then she transitioned to the role of literacy intervention specialist, which is the position she has today. Kim earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in elementary education and her master's in reading education from Saginaw Valley State University. Kim was nominated for the Shining Star by a colleague and among the comments are, Kim is a key part of our literacy team. Some of the many highlights of her work include creating data protocols, supporting teachers and paraprofessionals with summer school interventions and instruction, supporting teachers in aligning interventions and implementing progress monitoring tools and supporting data digs. That sounds fun. Kim was our very first literacy coach at MPS. Kim has a gift in building relationships with students and staff. She's a hands-on coach and is always willing to model lessons in classrooms and work alongside teachers. Kim's creativity shines through her work, rethinking schedules, and reimagining interventions. She is a true asset to Midland Public Schools. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. We'll get a whole group picture when we're done. Shannon, come stand next to me. Shannon Panasic joined our team in 2018 as a literacy intervention specialist, the position that she currently holds. She earned her Bachelor of Science degree in Social Studies and Language Arts from CMU and her Master's in Teaching, uh, excuse me, in Elementary Reading and Literacy from Mary Grove University. Also nominated by a colleague, the comments include, Shannon is a key part of our team. Some of the many highlights of her work including, include planning and facilitating professional learning at the building and district level for both teaching staff and our paraprofessionals, training staff on interven interventions and best practices in literacy, creating individualized reading improvement plans tailored to each student. Shannon is organized, prompt, and a wealth of knowledge. She is a great resource to her peers. Shannon is part of what makes it a great day to be a Bulldog. She is eager to help in any capacity and shares her knowledge of literacy instruction to benefit all students. Congratulations. Annalisa, come on over. Annalisa Christensen joined our MPS team in 2018 as a literacy intervention specialist. She still is here with us today. She earned her Bachelor of Science degree in psychology and social work from Eastern Michigan University and her master's in literacy studies from Western Michigan University. Also nominated by a colleague, comments include, Annalisa is a key part of our team. She goes above and beyond to support teachers, administrators, and students. This often involves meeting with teachers before, during, and after school, as well as during prep time and lunch. She's a dedicated learner, spending countless hours learning and studying the new curriculum to improve the literacy of our youngest learners at MPS. Annalisa is a true professional. She is kind, considerate, helpful, positive, caring, and the list goes on. Every interaction I have with her is a bright spot in my work. Congratulations. We have this for you. Come stand by me, Tricia. Patricia Clancy joined our team in 1990 as a second grade teacher at Woodcrest. She's also held roles as a reading recovery teacher, a first grade teacher, a sixth grade math and ELA teacher, and now she is a literacy intervention specialist. She earned her Bachelor of Art degree from the University of Michigan and her master's degree in early childhood development from CMU. Also nominated by a colleague among the comments are the following. She is a key part of our literacy team. Some of the highlights of her work include attending and at times co-facilitating our uh, student support specialist teams, which are to provide those extra resources to students, collaborating and co-facilitating meetings with PYP coordinators to meet the needs of grade level teaching teams, creating grade level scope and sequence documents with new curricular materials, and attending summer workshops for improved literacy knowledge. 
Trisha is a student-centered uh, professional in everything that she does. She goes above and beyond to collaborate, plan. All right. Um, congratulations. And uh, moving on, we have uh, some more exciting news. We have elementary literacy. <laughs> Jen. Team. All right, it is up. Good evening, and on behalf of the elementary team, I would like to thank you for having us this evening. And I only have nine slides, not 79, so we'll keep it brief. <laughs> uh, we are here to share the amazing literacy work happening in our elementary buildings. When thinking about a title for our literacy work, Lean Into was brought to our attention. As we explored what it means to lean into, we found these statements. To pursue a task with great effort and determination, to embrace fully or respond wholeheartedly, uh, the act of embracing something difficult or challenging by using it to empower yourself. These statements resonated with us and perfectly described the work that we were embarking upon. So leaning into literacy became the title and vision for our work. As mentioned in the provided case study document a few years ago, MPS adopted a new ELA curriculum, making it the first elementary literacy adoption since the mid-1990s. This curriculum resource is aligned to the Michigan K-12 standards in English language arts and the Michigan Department of Education Early Literacy Essentials. In addition, our curriculum also supports other district initiatives around diversity, equity, and inclusion, social emotional learning, and the inquiry-based framework of the PYP. Early on in our journey, we realized what a large-scale task this literacy adoption was it was evident that we needed to look closely at our system and identify ways that we could create the conditions necessary to support a successful implementation. In the 22-23 school year, our literacy team had the opportunity to attend an organizational practices conference hosted by MDE. It was there that we attended breakout sessions on organizational change and we learned about the consultation services available through the Literacy Leader Network. We brought this news <clears throat> and new learning back to Penny and soon after engaged in a partnership with Dr. Kehlani Dunsmore of the Literacy Leader Network. Our team is here tonight to highlight some of the work that we are doing with administrators, with teachers, and students, and to, sh to share with you strategies that we have put into place to support our initiative and implementation. <clears throat> Last spring, we brought elementary teacher or elementary principals, excuse me, together to start our professional learning journey. As a team, we created a literacy vision aligned to our district vision. We know that many children are thriving in literacy, but our vision is to have all children reach literacy success. Therefore, we want to cultivate in all students the literacy knowledge, skills, attitudes, and habits needed to achieve success. Now I would like to introduce Trisha Clancy, one of our literacy coaches, to share some of our systems level work. In order to improve um, student outcomes, as we hope, um, we need to focus on changing teacher practice so that teacher practice is research aligned, um, and more effective. Um, as this document or this slide shows you, we can't really only focus though on what's happening in the classroom because in order for teachers to be successful, the system needs to provide the conditions that they need to reach that success. So um, under them needs to be system commitments, professional learning and implementation support. And we, um, we need strong instructional leadership and we need effective literacy coaching in order for teachers to be effective. If we only focus our improvement efforts on the classroom and the classroom teachers, we're not going to get the results that we need. That was a big part of our work with um, the Literacy Leader Network is really figuring out how we were going to achieve that 
um, those supports underneath our classroom teachers. So the very first thing that we did was we created a document called the Literacy Framework. And what this document does is it takes the components that are necessary in our classrooms to be happening daily for all students and really helps us um, to outline them very specifically and then align those practices to our new curriculum resources. So it's a document that helps teachers to know um, what are the things that they absolutely must be doing and really makes clear for them the practices that should be happening every day with all the children. So from there, we um, asked our literacy leader, our building leadership teams that are really our school improvement teams. We, they're the MyKIP teams. We brought them together in June and really asked them to analyze building data in light of the literacy framework and um, select based on that data and their knowledge of their building, one high leverage practice that would be the focus of their improvement efforts for the first 12 weeks of the school year. Because by creating small improvement cycles over a short period of time with a very narrow focus for improvement, um, will accelerate change much more uh, quickly than if you have broader goals that you're looking at and setting in the fall and not looking at again until the spring. So these short inquiry cycles were really um, our first step toward systems change. So first the building improvement teams um, selected um, a school-wide focus and then they began creating what we called an implementation or action plan. And in these plans, they um, each building selected strategies in order to create that improvement. Most of those strategies really fall on the coaches and the instructional leaders in the building. Again, providing the supports and conditions necessary for teachers to be successful. And then as we implement those, um, we collect data and um, reflect on how it's going. And then at the end of 12 weeks, we determined, do we need to stick with this focus tweak it or switch to a new one. And with our first, we have completed our first inquiry cycle and four of our buildings decided to stick with their first um, focus and just tweak it a little and two have moved on to a new one. Um, so what we want to do for you tonight in the handout that we gave you, we outlined many of the strategies, but we really just want to highlight three of them um, for you um, here tonight. And the first one um, I'm going to talk about, and then I, my colleagues will talk about um, a few others. The first one that we really did was align our coaching to those building focus areas. So what we're trying to do is make sure that about 80% of coaching that's happening is happening around those building uh, focus areas. And that uh, coaching takes on several different um, forms and is implemented by our team of Shining stars, right? Um, they do district level PD. Um, they do full staff PD at the building level. And then where the real work happens, I think, is um, at the grade level or individual teacher level. And th that work happens in coaching cycles where teachers um, really pick an area where they need to focus. And then um, the coaches co-plan lessons, model, co-teach, they're right there in the classroom, providing that job embedded, immediate feedback, and then there's also a huge part of reflective conversation where teachers' learning is solidified, re-examined, new goals are set. Sometimes that ends the, co um, the coaching cycle, but sometimes it moves into a second coaching cycle. So, um, and then my role as a coach from the Claire Gladwin RESD is to support them in that work. Um, so, that is ooh, our coaching. And um, next, we're going to have Kara Stark and Chelsea Sove from Central Park talking about another strategy. All right, so now we have the privilege to speak about our PGL journey. PGL stands for Ongoing Professional Growth and Learning for the administration team. The heavy focus for the elementary team has been literacy instruction. 
So prior to the start of the school year, our PGL kicked off with a training for all building administrators um, with Steve Seward. He's an educational leading consultant. Um, and within this first PGL session, we learned about different modes of communication, the different types of learning styles of adults, and tools to lead our staff in ways that honor their strengths and what they can contribute to our teams. Next, we had the opportunity to take district inventory of literacy instruction by utilizing the school-wide essential practices screening tool, tool. Additionally, we analyzed the LOCI survey, which was a survey that was taken by all the teachers at the end of last school year to indicate their level of capacity within literacy practices. Over the summer, we took the results from the survey and we utilized the same analyzing tool we learned in our previous PB PGL session to support our continuous improvement team in deciding on what our specific goals would be. So now we have monthly PGL sessions that have been focused on supporting the implementation of the building specific goals and practices for teachers. Some of these include gradual release of responsibility and creating collaborative culture. Ultimately, um, PGL has provided a space for ongoing learning that supports building administrators and really becoming instructional leaders. This has been essential for literacy implementation and has allowed us to learn alongside our fellow educators. And next we have Tracy Renfro from Adams. Thank you. So you've heard about coaching and you've heard about our PGL journey, another strategy that most if not all buildings implemented uh, with the learning labs. Those looked a little different in the buildings. At Adams, we used an entire day where all staff were able to go in and take a look at teachers in action with small group instruction, as that's our focus. Other buildings did it by grade levels, um, but each of our buildings used the strategy. With me, I have Nicole Ballette, first grade teacher. She was one of our teachers who provided a small group lesson for others to go in and watch and she's going to talk about that as well as her experience watching colleagues. Thank you Tracy. Um, I had the privilege like she mentioned to be observed by some of my colleagues and it was a really reflective experience um, for me as a professional and I felt that Coming in, I wasn't really nervous because we have a really good collaborative culture at our building, which made um, it really helpful. And as Tracy had mentioned, we created a look for document as um, a building and we went through and you went step by step and you didn't feel like they were looking necessarily at you as an instructor, but tips and tricks that they could use to reflect back on their own practice. So it was really reflective um, being observed. And then on the flip side, when I went to observe other teachers. Um, it made me want to go back, reflect on what I'm doing, dive right in on making some changes. And it's always good to get around and see what other people are doing in your building. Um, it makes us feel connected and it really helps me think what I'm doing has a greater purpose as they move on throughout the rest of their education. So I really enjoyed it. Thanks team. Uh, thank you for highlighting our work and the strategies that we have started to implement in our buildings. As you can see, we are committed to systems change because we know that it will bring to fruition the vision we have for all students to achieve literacy success. Thank you. I'll just add a couple of quick comments. Uh, thank you so much, team. And, you know, Jen Service didn't get a shining star tonight, but she's <laughs> up there on the list. Uh, she is the one that keeps this work moving forward and has done a really remarkable job helping us stay true to our vision. I'm really proud of the work of this team. I hope tonight, board members, that you can see this kind of system work is building the capacity of everyone. And it's really, I love this phrase, creating the conditions for success. Brian and Jeff and I and Melissa and Jen are committed to creating the conditions for our principals to be successful, carving out these monthly PGL sessions where they can come together. They've really bonded as an elementary team in this shared learning. The work is hard, uh, but it's a little easier when you know that you have colleagues alongside you in the learning and planning. And part of the beauty of this model is there is a consistency we're building across the district, but we're still honoring what each school really needs through those rapid uh, development improvement cycles. 
it's really a beautiful thing. So we are committed to resourcing this. We're committed to providing the time, uh, the energy, the nudge when needed to keep us moving forward and uh, really proud of this work. So thank you. I have a question. That's a coaching question, Mrs. Clancy. <laughs> um, you've been really driving home the idea of changing the way teachers teach since June. So in, even before that a little bit, so we're you know, six, eight months later, what kind of changes are you seeing? Uh, is this, and is the strategy working? So one of the things that we know is change can be slow. So um, we have seen um, some changes. Not We are not where we want to be. Um, so I'll say that first. But some of the things that we're seeing um, is we're seeing that um, small group instruction is happening in classrooms every day. And that was not always the case. Um, it's that differentiation um, where children get their needs met. So just putting that practice into place and making sure it's happening in every classroom is huge. Um, another thing that um, we're noticing is the um, sense of collaboration across the buildings. So um, with our, um, I think Adam's staff um, alluded to our look for documents. So. What those are is we take a practice, say, small group instruction or writing workshop mini lessons, and we've really separated that out into really small parts. This is what it looks like. And so what we're getting across the school and really across the system is a better understanding and a clearer vision of what those effective practices are. We know better now what, what our target is. And through backward design, we're creating the, the um, professional development opportunities for teachers to get better and better at that. So, um, and then what we're finding with our, our surveys that we're giving is we're ask, asking teachers about their confidence because what we found, or what research has found is that confidence level actually is a good indicator for how um, much improvement is happening. And we are seeing that teachers are feeling more confident in these practices, um, at least marginally, not hugely, but um, we are seeing some okay. changes. I, I think this is a wonderful initiative, and I would be really excited to see what kind of results or data that are produced um, a year from now, you know, and see where we're at and look, look at the growth along the way and the, the amount of change that um, has resulted because of this. And it sounds like you've got a lot of administrative support, so please keep going. It, it, it's great. We're really excited. I'm glad you see that. I'll just jump in because I can't miss a chance to say... Uh, you know, our teachers are working incredibly hard. They always have. And, and so framing this the way uh, our team did is really important for us to remember. Teachers have always been doing what they thought was best for, for students. But as the new information comes to us uh, and we have our new curriculum, the essential practices, it's really just helping them sharpen their practice. And uh, I just want us to acknowledge that we know we have amazing teachers who've been working hard every day. Creating these systems should make their job um, a little easier because we're doing it with lots of support. What other questions do you have for this awesome group? So maybe to put a finer point on the data, how are we gonna measure success? What is our our data function. Yeah, so Is it NWEA? all of this really should result in student growth and achievement, right? That's what we're after. Increased literacy yep. in our elementaries. And of course, NWEA is one measure that we can use. Our uh, state assessment is the measure, of course, that our public uses. And we're all working in that direction. Okay. So we should be able to see gains in this. It is, uh, it feels like a rapid process because of the short improvement cycles. But it's going to take time. Mm -hmm. Curriculum implementation of this magnitude, changing our, the way that we uh, teach is, is a multi-year endeavor. So speaking of a multi-year endeavor, one other comment I think at this point, because I don't expect an answer to it, but how do, we, how do we continue to involve our parents and community partners so that we don't just put the burden on our teachers because they have a lot on their plate already, mm -hmm. but how do we make sure that we involve all of the students 
assets that are available to them such that we I don't want at home I don't want to teach literacy different than how you're teaching it. I want to teach from your playbook and help and assist the teachers that are doing it the right way, mm -hmm. not just somebody that does it <laughs> fly by the seat of their pants, but you know, how do we continue to yeah, thanks for bringing that to light. I think we do have an opportunity, if one of you want to jump in, to think more about partnering with families. Sure, and um, I, to go back also, Phil, to your um, collecting data, one of the things that is a really big part of this work is co-constructing a robust prog progress monitoring system. Um, we're spending a lot of time putting that together so that we have that um, concrete for teachers with some teaching and learning around that so that will be great one of the things with the read by grade 3 law is um, indiv individualized reading improvement plans for students those are co-created with teacher and coach and families and so there is some you know really intentional work around that as well but yes for sure partnering with families getting the word out there of how to support students at home to support the work we're doing here Um, obviously, we know that our ESSER funds are sunsetting soon, and I know that literacy obviously is a piece of that, that we could apply dollars to that. So my question is really for Brian, I would guess, is that <laughs> now that we have this program in place, I want to make sure that this momentum is continued um, with our dollars and cents from our general fund as well as what is the opportunity to add additional funds to this to make sure that we are successful across the district with all these people so brad actually i'll take that one okay. first and then brian can chime in so we have had literacy specialists long before these covid supplemental yep. funds and our intention is to continue funding them uh, through that grant there are other grants that we get that support literacy work that were not necessarily related to COVID. Uh, the curriculum purchases were uh, certainly helped by COVID uh, relief funds. I think we're in pretty good financial standing to support this moving forward. We have an existing professional learning budget through our curriculum office annual budgeting process and our team knows that there are internal processes, the staff development proposal process, as well as the budget request process where we can resource this. Uh, and uh, Brian and I are committed through the budget process to make sure that principals and teachers have what they need to continue this. Okay. What would you add, Brian? I, I just I think you said it very eloquently. Um, there are supplemental funds such as 35A5 and other literacy initiatives that keep coming up but I just want to double down on what Penny said. We support the MyKit process, which is our continuous improvement process, and that process drives what our priorities in our budget are. Um, our budget doesn't drive the priorities, the priorities drive the allocation amongst the budget. And so um, the commitment level on our end is to ensure that those funds get to programs that we believe have potential growth opportunities. And it's my job to try and make sure that Jen has the money that she needs um, to be able to carry these things out and she and I smile at each other because, um, yeah. <laughs> money is one part of it, uh, focus and time is the other. So maintaining this commitment that those monthly professional growth and learning sessions are dedicated to this for the foreseeable future so that this team has a chance to collaborate is also important. And you know my ability to say no to other shiny things that might come our way right now for elementary and protect the focus that we have with this initiative is going to be important. It's a great question, thank you. questions okay thank you so much for thank coming you. tonight we really appreciate your work
Merry Christmas to everybody who's walking out. We'll still be here. Okay, uh, that'll bring us to item 3.3, Superintendent Search Process Update. Mr. Rush. Yes. Um, I'm going to go to the website because everything, Sarah did a fantastic job of taking our last meeting and putting it on the homepage, the Midland Public School homepage. Um, but under the MPS homepage, there's a superintendent search category with our timeline. Um, for the rest of the search process uh, from now through July 1st, as well as a schedule for upcoming um, focus groups. So two action items for the community. One is you've got two days to get your uh, survey done. That closes on the 20th. And then the second action item is to find which focus group you can attend and put it on your calendar. That's all I have. Okay, thanks for the update. Uh, next up, item 3.4. This is an action item. This is operating millage author authorizing resolution. And we'll kick this over to Brian. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. So at the last Board of Education meeting, I gave you a brief presentation on the history of our operating millage, which included two components, the non-homestead 18 mil component and also our hold harmless component as well too. Um, this evening, as we stated at the last meeting, we are presenting to you the official authorizing resolution for your approval this evening. This will allow us to officially notify the county and the city of Midland clerks to place this initiative on the May 2024 ballot. And again, that initiative includes 18 mil non-homestead assessment um, and a 5.6523 rate renewal of our hold harmless. These are renewals of a millage that has been in place since 1994. Thank you, Brian. Okay, I will accept the motion uh, for item 3.4. Motion by Mr. Lauterbach, support by Mr. Hatfield, and this does require a roll call vote. I'm All sorry, right. before we get there, any additional discussion about uh, item 3.4? Okay, go ahead, John. All right, President McFarland? Yes. Vice President Rausch? Yes. Secretary Hatfield is yes. Treasurer Lauterbach? Yes. Member Blazy? Yes. Member Ringgold? Yes. Member Horowitz? Yes. Unanimous. Okay, unanimous. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, next up is item four. This is our request to address the board. And I did run out and take a quick look at the list, and there was nobody on it. Um, does anybody wish to address the board tonight? Mr. And Mrs. Bonadies? No? Okay. Merry Christmas to both of you. Thank you for coming again. Good back there? Okay. Wow. All right then. Uh, we'll move on. Item five, curriculum instruction and assessment. 5.1, we have committee study minutes, study committee minutes uh, from Brad. Four, five, and six was presented. We did some classroom visits. Uh, the committee visited two Woodcrest classrooms. The first was a Mandarin lesson, and the second was a math lesson that highlighted the use of instructional technology, which was really awesome. Um, Diversity, equity, and inclusion update. Joy shared a summary of recent workshops completed with MPS staff, as well as student-centered activities that promote greater inclusion. The Sex Education Advisory Committee, Velocini, presented the 2324 Sex Education Advisory Board membership list and discussed the purpose of the board, and we were able to adjourn at 320. All right, thank you very much. Uh, next up is information only. This is item 5.2, um, major change proposals. Yes, thank you. Tonight I have for consideration the major change proposal 
to bring IB Mandarin 4, 5, and 6 onto our records. It would be for grades 10, 11, and 12. The total cost of this proposal is $13,921. It includes all anticipated expenses such as curriculum development, staff development, uh, and staff and student materials. The expenses for total implementation are described in the actual proposal, which is available in my office should anyone wish to review that. Uh, board action is, of course, anticipated in December, so this will come back to you. Uh, I want to be very clear in sharing that we are nearing uh, enrollment time for our high school students. So our past practice, we will continue, which is to list this as a tentative option in our course selection sheet. When you uh, take action on this in December, we will either remove that if you don't approve it or we will uh, make it official. So this is, of course, contingent upon final budget approval as well. We'll bring this back next month. Okay, thanks, Penny. Um, next up, we have Finance, Facilities, and Operations, item 6.1, Study Committee Minutes. John. One second. Oh, did I miss something? Well, she kept mentioning December board meeting. So how are we coming back to that? Because this is it. January. Okay, that's what it says. It it's says January. December. So you bring it back next month. We'll bring month. it back in January. Okay. Thanks for that. Yep. It's like I'm trying to just trick y'all. Nope. January. Scott was serious that we're staying we, we until Christmas. Christmas. We're staying <laughs> okay, 6.1, John. October financials were reviewed. Variances from year to year were discussed. Revenue variances were due to the timing of receiving some taxes. We discussed the operating millage authorized resolution. Or we'll be asked to approve the resolution authorized the launch of May 2024 to review the NPS operating and pay progress tax revenue. We discussed the Series 2 bond audit. NPS was required to conduct an audit on Series 2 bond funds as they were making balance below 5% Okay, thanks for the update. Uh, next is item 6.2. This is the first in a series of action items. Elementary collaboration furniture. Yep. Mr. Bruton. Thank you. I'll veer just a touch from this script and just note that this purchase was realized as a part of walkthroughs that Superintendent Miller Nelson has implemented um, amongst our administrative team. And when we were out observing literacy initiatives that were presented this evening, this came up as something that we believe would enhance that instruction. So through those observations and feedback, it indicated that our delivery could be enhanced through the procurement of furniture designed for the collaborative grouping that you heard about this evening. Buildings uh, were surveyed, they requested 70 horseshoe shaped whiteboard tables and 400 adjustable wobble motion stools. We solicited bids and we are recommending issuing a purchase order to Grand River Office Supply of Muskegon for a total price of $50,752. And if it has your approval this evening, we'll utilize ESSER 3 funds. Excellent, thank you. 
I will accept the motion for item 6.2. I move for the purchase of, for item 6.2, purchase of elementary collaboration <laughs> furniture. Motion by Mr. Hatfield, support by Mr. Ringgold. Any additional discussion? All Brian surveyed. Yep. They we just fulfilled their dream list. So all of the buildings have some touch Correct. point here. Central Park did not request. Brian, what is a I have one in my <laughs> office. <laughs> Feel free to stop in my office after. It's those small stools. They have the circular platform and these move. So if you got it, I'll bring it in here. But our liability insurance says that uh, protect the core. Right? Don't slip a disc. Um, but the kids love them. <laughs> That's correct. Yes. Yep. And these are adjustable, so it allows kids to go up and down on them. Um, we saw these in place at Plymouth. Plymouth were able to purchase these through Title I funds a year or so back. And when we saw the kids working on these, it is so much better than what we saw in other buildings where we were using kind of a hobbled together approach. This will really enhance the delivery. Well, thanks for that realization and walking through and, and doing that survey. Um, any additional discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next up, item 6.3, we have a walk-in freezer at Central Park. Thank you. We previously asked you to approve an additional freezer over at Midland High due to the increased service volume of our food. We also need a walk-in freezer at Central Park Elementary as well, too. We did solicit bids and we are recommending issuing a purchase order for the freezer and the installation to Rolls Mechanical of Fenton, Michigan for a total price of $68,250. And if this has your approval this evening, we will utilize food service funds for the purchase. Okay, I will accept the motion for item 6.3. With the adoption of item 6.3, the purchase of the walk-in freezer from Central Park. Motion by Mr. Lauterbach, support by Mrs. Ringgold. Any additional discussion for 6.3? Go ahead. Um, have we seen, I will get to the next question, that will make more sense. Have we seen uh, a great increase in the number of meals served at Central Park in light of the, the free breakfast and lunch through the Michigan? Jeff can chime in here to, to enhance. Um, System-wide, we're almost double. Um, specifically to Central Park, I don't have the numbers in my head, Anne but we can definitely get those to you. So my substitute question obviously is, say we don't have that funding next year, do we still need this freezer next year? We believe that this funding is gonna be memorialized in the state budget. Um, I'm not sure, Penny, if they've taken specific action, but I know I've seen it come up many, many times, and I don't believe that there is, I'm gonna use the word appetite, pun intended, um, for this to be removed a second time. We experienced that once before and um, the impacts were quite drastic. So we believe that this is going to be a sustained practice. And Brian, this is part of the funds that we have to spend. Right? That is Before correct. Yes. Okay. Any additional discussion? I did, I did want to make a comment, uh, a couple things. One, uh, I know you can't make people bid, but in our October purchase of the freezer, we had the three major players of Stafford Smith, Refrigeration and Mechanical Service, and Rolls. So we had three major players. This time around, we only got the Rolls and then Ted's Electric, which is not a normal choice for that. I know you can't make people bid, but we need to really strive hard to try to get out to those people the best that we can um, each time that we have something that's right up their alley and being refrigeration equipment. Um, the other part is not um, is is more of a comment that I wanted uh, the team to be aware. I absolutely believe that we need this and that should vote for this. But I also wanted to let you know um, from a safety seminar that I went to not long ago that uh, walk-in coolers are defined as a confined space, and we need to make sure that we have an SOP in place that. Uh, make sure that we keep everybody safe. And a confined space is a space that has limited or restricted means of entry. It's not designed for continuous occupancy. It is large enough and configured so that a person can enter the space and maneuver well enough to perform tasks. So we just need to make sure that we're keeping our people safe and we have an SOP in place 
for both of these walk-in freezers or any freezers that we have because they are a confined space by law. Mm -hmm. Good catch. Okay. Thanks, Brad. Mm -hmm. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you very much. Motion carries. Uh, 6.4 is 9 through 12 Chromebook purchases. Brian. Thank you. An analysis of our technology needs indicated that it is appropriate timing for us to replace our high school devices. Bids were solicited and we are recommending issuing a purchase order to Riverside Technologies of North Sioux City, South Dakota for $897,000. This purchase includes 2,600 HP Chromebook, 11 G9 computers, management licenses, white glove service, and also protective cases. And if it has your approval this evening, we will utilize ESSER three funds for this purchase. Okay, thanks, Brian. I will accept the motion for item 6 4. Support. Motion by Mr. Lauterbach, support by Mr. Rausch. Any additional discussion for item 6.4? Yes, from a, a sustainability standpoint, the bond, this current one, is for technology. Are we saving any of those funds? replacing using ESSER funds or not? Or like, did we know this was already coming that the 912 would need to be replaced? Sure. Um, we did have these purchases scheduled in our series three bonds. As was indicated in the previous board meetings when we purchased buses, prices on things continuously change. And so we are trying to do our best to maximize our series three bonds. And when the opportunity arose for us to be able to do this out of ESSER three funds due to some unanticipated categoricals, it seemed the right strategic move to be able to sustain those series three bonds to be able to do future capital purchases. Brian, why do, why do these get bid out as they are versus the state system that we use for? ESSER three funds have deeper requirements to okay. them and we have to put certain conditions and caveats on it that are far beyond Got what it. other recommendations okay. are. Okay. So if we were to approve this tonight, which I'm sure we will, how long is it going to take to get these? Okay, great. That's awesome. You better approve it then. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but they'll be for next year then, or are you going to swap out Wow. Ambitious. I like it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Creative will be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? Questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Okay. Motion carries. Order the computers. Thank you. Let's get them. Uh, next up, information only, item 6.5, Mr. Bruton. Thank you for information this evening. There are 13 gifts totaling $10,986. They represent a wide variety of supports for MPS, ranging from various robotics teams to Kindness Week. Per tradition, all donors will be recognized in the broadcast credits of this evening's meeting and also through board correspondence. We certainly appreciate the generosity of our donors. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving along, we are at item seven, human resources. There are no study committee minutes, as far as I'm aware. Okay, uh, which will take us to information only. Item 7.1, Mr. Jester. Thank you, sir. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. For information, the board and staff extend their deepest sympathy to the families of the following past employees. First, uh, Miss Sally Moss. She passed away November 11, 2023. Sally was employed as a teacher for the Developmental Kindergarten Pilot Program at Cook from 1987 uh, through 1988 as a young fives teacher at Carpenter from 1988 <clears throat> excuse me, until her retirement in 1992. Uh, next, uh, to the family of Miss Virgiline Tolly, she passed away November 29th, 2023. Virgiline was employed as switchboard operator at Midland High School from 1961 to 63, and then again from 70 to 73. And then from 1973 until she retired in 1992, she was employed as one of the secretaries here in the administration building, uh, coordinator's section of the admin building. And when she retired in 1992, she had 24 years of service with the district. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we have correspondence to and from the Board of Education. Item 8.1 uh, is a list of letters from the Board of Education to the uh, listed individuals and entities. 
in the agenda. Um, item nine is scheduled activities, is information only. Uh, 9.1 is a list of regular and special meetings of the Board of Education for 2024. Uh, please note on January 16th that we are starting at 6.30 p.m. instead of 7 for our, our annual organizational meeting. And the uh, remaining dates there are, of course, tentative through June uh, pending approval. Um, item 10, we have a closed session, attorney-client privilege. Sure. Excellent point. Thank you, John. Okay. Um, I will accept the motion to move into closed session. Or do we do we need a motion? Yeah, yeah we do. Yeah. Motion by Mr. Hatfield, support by Mr. Lauterbach. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. We'll move into closed session. All right, we are back in open session coming out of closed session where we discussed attorney-client privilege communications pursuant to Section 8H of the Michigan Open Meetings Act, MCL 15.268, paragraph H, regarding a legal opinion. Uh, moving on, we are in item 11. This is our study discussion session. Do we have any points of clarification to talk about? None. Okay. Uh, yes. Thank you very much, Jen. Okay, Penny, the floor is Just yours. Just a couple of comments. Uh, so I echo uh, Jen's comments about exam week. And, you know, we wish students well, but it's not the end all be all, yes. Uh, I wanted you all to know that, you know, the past two weeks at Central Auditorium, we've had 10 uh, winter concerts. That place has been hopping. And although I've only made it to about uh, half of them, just over half of them, it was such a great moment to remember what a strong music program we have. Uh, those teachers really dedicate a lot of time and energy to preparing students. And it's great to really see on full display that progression from sixth grade all the way uh, to senior year. So just a big shout out to our music program. They did a great job. I should mention, you reminded me. Yes, go ahead. That I had some amazing visitors on Saturday. The Midland High Meister singers were out Christmas caroling. And it was a pretty amazing opportunity to see our students, but most of all, the interaction of our choir teacher at Midland High with his students was pretty inspiring. Thanks for sharing that. And I would just like to say thank you for making the time to go to the conference because I know that means a lot to students and staff. Thanks. Yeah. It's yeah. pretty joyful. And I'm not going to lie, one fun thing because I sit in the back because I don't want to take up a seat is uh, JR, let me yeah. work some of the buttons. <laughs> oh, <nice. laughs> I don't take okay. uh, no, I don't, I don't want to take, take up a seat. seat. I typically stand back there. Um, I also just want to take a moment, you know, it's the end of the first semester, the end of this week, and we're moving into winter break. And just a moment of gratitude for our entire MPS team. You heard tonight uh, some great literacy specialists and principals who are working really hard. All of our teachers are. Brian and Jeff and I and Melissa and Jen and any combination, uh, we have visited almost 200 classrooms this first semester, 196 visits we've done. And we're just seeing firsthand the amazing teachers that we have and how dedicated they are. So, and our paraprofessionals for sure, we're seeing them in classrooms. We visited lunchrooms. 
uh, we're just we're getting the full the full spectrum and it's pretty spectacular. So lots of gratitude for the whole team and what they're doing to just maintain the excellence that we expect here in Midland Schools. And I also wish each of you an amazing winter break, a wonderful holiday season. I hope everyone spends <clears throat> some time doing the things that bring them lots of joy and rest and restoration and relaxation for semester two. Yes. Thanks, Penny. Take a motion to adjourn. All in favor, say aye. Aye. aye.